I had the game and I had the game because it was one of the, I got a pack of games that came with my Game Boy Color. I was a little bit young for the first Game Boy, but I got the, the Game Boy Color, the purple thing, and I think it was for my 10th birthday, which would have been in about 99. Um, and Tetris was one of the games that I played. So I knew it from that. It's obviously such a, a, a staple and an iconic game in the, in the gaming community. And that was my first introduction. My character, Hank, is a Dutch-born American publisher of games who at the point at the, the start of the film was residing in Japan with his family. And he basically discovers the game at, um, at a sort of a games fair in Las Vegas and is immediately able to see its potential. And so he sets about on this kind of mission really to secure the rights and over the course of the story he learns about the imminent release of Nintendo's Game Boy, has the the idea to package the game with Game Boy. Um, so it's this sort of moment, it, it, it's this kind of incredible story that sort of happens at this moment of of cultural zeitgeist really for this for this game and Hank is a kind of affable larger than life kind of cowboy figure really who kind of goes out on a limb to to um, to make his fortune and get the rights to Tetris. He and I spoke, as I said, over Zoom, as is the way that you speak to most people these days in you know early 2021, to anyone who's watching in the future. Um, uh, and you're right, there is an, always an element of responsibility that comes with playing somebody who is a real person. But it is always a story. It is always a story informed by real events. You know, a lot of what happens in the movie is real, but as ever, it's a film. And for the purposes of storytelling and structure and it being entertaining, there is always some liberties taken. But I personally, for my part, I always just feel if you seek to humanize somebody and make them relatable and three-dimensional, then you are doing them the, the right service, I hope. To anybody who knows anything about acting and, and theatre, you know, Russia is kind of the mecca for a lot of schools of thought about acting and any actors that have undergone any training that's based on the work of Stanislavski. You know, it's obviously held in high regard the world over, but no, nowhere more than Russia. Um, and it really, really shows in the work that, that those guys churn out, you know. Nikita, who I love, is just just such an incredible performer, so kind of alive and available and has such a great facility of warmth. And I think he, more than anyone, is the heart of the, of the film, really, and has a real kind of quiet dignity to him. And then you have, you know, people like, you know, Oleg, who has this incredible experience and, and such a rich history of, of great work, and he's just such an amazing craftsman. It's been such a pleasure to watch him work. And then there's, you know, you have Igor and Sofia and everybody else all doing wonderful supporting work too. So it's been an amazing experience working. A lot of great suits, um, this one being the hero one. Um, and yeah, there's, uh, there's just this sort of working with Nat, you know, we wanted to kind of bring this element of extroversion out in him to sort of throw him into relief against what is quite an, I would say, austere palette that's being used for Russia in terms of the the lighting and the costume and the set design. And it's just to sort of create the sense that Hank is of the other, really, you know, and is kind of westernized and is, and is, is a stranger and an alien in this land. Um, and then in terms of hair and this thing and, you know, I'm a little bit rosier than I normally am, that's all largely informed by Hank's actual aesthetic, you know, this is pretty near to, to how he styled himself at the time, which is great fun because it's so far removed from me and that's always great pleasure and Jan Sewell was amazing in helping me build. I think it was, a, it defines a real moment in the lives of people who are anywhere between, I would guess, kind of, you know, oh, I don't know, 35 and 60 really, you know, but I'm sure everyone remembers that happening and it's probably a lovely way of kind of sharing that moment of somebody's past with their children and um i think it's I, I think the reason audiences will enjoy it are probably the same reasons that matthew vaughan likes to try and put these things together it was a sort of colorful larger than life period of time where people did 
sort of make themselves look like this and kind of did wear crazy kooky big shawl you know and it's it's fun there's something very sort of sensory and extreme about it that is, that makes for great viewing that's just from an aesthetic perspective but then you've also got this mad mad story that's kind of remained fairly hidden for the past 30 years despite the game being so popular so it's quite exciting to think that it the sort of backstory to this cultural phenomenon will finally get its moment in the sunlight as it were.